Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a Friday Reads of three books completed and one in progress. Nicola Barker's latest book, I Am Sovereign. Toby Litt, King Death. Concrete by Thomas Bernhardt. And the book I haven't finished yet, but I've read enough of it to talk about, I think, is Mark Dani Danieluski, Only Revolutions. So we're going to start with Nicola Barker, my fourth Nicola Barker, and I am done, I'm afraid. She should be in my wheelhouse because she writes experimental or unconventional uh, novels. They're all quite different from each other. But uh, the Happy was the one that preceded this and this. They just seem to be getting more and more annoying, really. Uh, and there's a point towards the end of this book where... Um, Barker goes, my last novel, i.e. Happy, um, sort of ruined or killed the novel for me. Uh, in which case she better find a new uh, <laughs> a new uh, literary form in which to write. So the action of this book takes place in 20 minutes of a viewing of a house for sale in Flandadno in Wales. The owner of the house is called Charles. He's a complete um, screw up of a character. Uh, the book starts by him saying how he can't get started on the book by a sort of life coach or, um, you know, sort of one of these self-help books. But he seems to watch an awful lot of this guy's YouTube videos. Uh, he's a hoarder. He um, goes on Amazon and buys lots of stuff he doesn't need and then, and then keeps it. And he seems to have the bailiffs chasing him, which is presumably why his house is up for sale. What he does for a living is he makes teddy bears very, very beautifully made, but he has no passion or, you know, for it. It's just a job to him. But unfortunately, as a hoarder, he can't actually relinquish and let go of any of them. The second character is Abigail, who is uh, the estate agent uh, charged with selling this house. And she is uh, someone who broke away from a Hasidic Jewish uh, family and has sort of reinvented herself um, as, as you know, an estate agent in a, in a small town in Wales. Um, but she can't quite let go or, sh or sort of, you know, uh, husk the influence of being brought up in the, the Hasidic Jewish family, both spiritually and socially in terms of that sort of overbearing, overweening um, sort of Jewish mother type of thing. The other two characters are... Um, both Chinese, a mother and a daughter. The mother only speaks Chinese and spends the whole viewing on her phone, cutting deals, but they're in Chinese, so no one knows what they actually are, including her daughter, because her daughter doesn't speak Chinese. Her daughter apparently only exists as a mirror of her mother. So three of the four characters here are struggling to assert their true natures, their true selves, hence the I am sovereignty. Uh, the Hasidic woman trying to break away from her Hasidic background, Charles who just doesn't have any kind of character at all, and uh, the Chinese daughter trying to break away from her mother. And that's it. You know, um, there's lots of sort of, you know, there's sort of individual cultural things uh, come to play. So sort of lucky numbers and unlucky numbers for the Chinese mother. Uh, a broom falls down, which is about the height of the action. Uh, that is taken to be very bad luck in Chinese culture as when a bird drops an oyster shell on her when she's walking up to the house and actually, you know, causes her head to bleed. That has no impact whatsoever. Um, so, there, you know, it's almost like a sort of farce, but not a sex farce in the theatre. But I can imagine this being sort of choreographed on a theatre stage. But in a book, it's just... It doesn't work because nothing, there's nothing of import here. All the characters are thoroughly hollow, dislikable. Um, and it's only really towards the end when we get a bit of sort of metafiction, when Nicola Barker asserts herself. And you realise the I am sovereign is also the writer trying to make herself sovereign because Nicola Barker is at war with a minor character who comes in um, uh, to steal a teddy bear. Um, and the character refuses to allow Nicola Barker to sort of probe his motives and, and all that, whereas all the others are much more sort of uh, willing to work with Barker. And again, this is why I say this reminds me more of a theatre piece. This is something like Pirandello's Six Actors in Search of a, uh, an Author. So things like, you know, when she's sort of negotiating with this, this character who won't, who won't play ball, 
you know, they're having a conversations on, on Snapchat. Uh, he's a fictional character, so you've got a real-life Nicola Barker writer voice in here having a Snapchat conversation with, you know, a character who won't play ball. And, you know, it's just... It's just dreadful, really. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read a, a bit. Um, the author suspects that this novella, which is currently in danger of becoming a novel, so needs to end quite soon, is either extremely deep or unbelievably trite. It is impossible to tell. The author, Gacy Chance Ebo, claims that he's a character who's sort of refusing to play ball. Will persist in calling it unbelievably trite because she is fundamentally disingenuous. The author, the author claims, will persist in calling it unbelievably trite because, at some profound level, it is unbelievably trite. Nothing of much happens. No, nothing of much note happens, really, does it? Aside from the oyster shell strike, everything else is merely filler and backstroke, backstory. Um, I, the reader, assert that this is incredibly trite and not profound at all. Um, Sorry, I'm done. Toby Litt, King Death. Uh, another book that annoyed me. Um, so, uh, a couple are on the point of breaking up. They've just been to visit his parents. He doesn't know that his girlfriend, who's Japanese... I say girlfriend, long-time partner, who is Japanese, is, is done with the relationship. She's bored. And on the train back, they're pulling into London Bridge Station, and they see a hand reaching out of one of the carriages in front and throwing what they later uh, realise is a human heart up onto a roof, just to say that London Bridge Station is very near Guy's Hospital, where the bulk of this book is set. And, you know, this is the second Toby Lit novel I've read set in a hospital, so I don't know if he's got a sort of a fixation about him, or he worked there or something. So, you know, they go they go in search of this heart, and, and it, you know, it, it sets off a whole sort of mystery story and out of the mystery of the heart which you know one of the medical students is, is accused of stealing and he's thrown out of medical school for the disrespect to the human organ um but it, it sort of you know turns out there's a, a deeper crime buried within this hospital the japanese woman is an artist by trade a sort of installation artist where she is the installation she is the heart of the art and she gets a sort of monomania, an obsession for to, you know, to, to clear the medical student and find the real perpetrator of this. And the guy, who is a sort of session musician to make some money, but he really wants to be a sort of, you know, proper free form jazz impro guitarist. He's so he's so sort of cut up by his girlfriend walking out on him that his sort of monomania, his obsession is that the best way to stick close to her is to sort of solve the crime and get back in her good books and also he can follow what she's up to and all this sort of stuff. So the two main characters are completely obsessed and this is one of the problems of the book because everyone they treat sort of passively acquiesces. They put up a fight saying, oh no, I'm not going to answer your questions or we've been told we can't say anything or we'll be booted out of medical school. But they all, they all, they all give in and, you know, answer their questions. You know, the, the, the girlfriend... Um, sets up uh, one of the female medical students, sort of dresses her, tells her, you know, what th what questions to ask, to go and seduce her ex-boyfriend because she thinks either it'll get him off her back because he'll be unfaithful by sleeping with this woman that the girlfriend has set up for him, or he'll show his true love because he'll refuse a sort of mirror copy of his girlfriend. Utterly perverse is, yeah, that's sort of credible, but utterly perverse is the girl who acquiesces in this and agrees to be completely restyled over the course of a weekend and set up into a, you know, a seduction which, you know, as if she has no feelings. And none of these other characters really have any credible reactions. They're all they're all sort of moved around like chess pieces by these these two main characters. It's simply not credible. Um, and I think that's about all I can say about this, really. The other characters were what really annoyed me, and, and, and you know, the, the two main characters are monomaniacal, so it's hard to sort of sympathise with them because they're so sort of out there, they're so fixated. Um, and everyone else just, just sort of goes along with it. You know, um, sorry, didn't like it. Oh, uh, so two stars. Uh, I think I gave this two stars as well. As you can see, not a very good reading week for me. Thomas Bernhardt, Concrete. So this is my first Thomas Bernhardt novel. I'd always thought that his works were sort of very dense, quite big, chunky novels. And I found this sort of quite short book, so I was quite 
please, this will be my introduction to Bernhardt. And having read it, I'm none the wiser, really. So I'm going to read the blurb on the back because this is the best summation of the book. Instead of the book he's meant to write, Rudolf, a Viennese musicologist, produces this dark and grotesquely funny account of small wo woes writ large, of profound horrors, horrors detailed and rehearsed to the point of distraction. We learn of Rudolf's sister, whose help he invites, then reviles as malevolent meddling. His really marvellous house, which he hates, the suspicious illness he carefully nurses, his ten-year-long attempt to write the perfect opening sentence, and finally, his escape to the island of Mallorca, which turns out to be the site of someone else's very real horror story. A brilliant and haunting tale of procrastination, failure and despair. Concrete is a perfect example of why Thomas Bernhard is remembered as one of the masters of contemporary European fiction, uh, as stated by George Steiner. And that's what this book is. It's a book about procrastination. It's a book about a misanthrope who blames everyone by himself uh, for getting in his way of, you know, basically emasculating him, taking away his creative powers, particularly his sister, but also society, the nature of how society has changed in Austria, sort of post-war. Sometimes he admits his own sort of contribution to his failings. But this book wasn't nearly as clever as I thought it would be. It, it's sort of, it's all written without paragraph break. So, you know, it is a sort of uh, stream of consciousness, but it's, it's more a sort of stream of invective. Um, and it's just not, it's, it's over the top, it's too much, it's, it's remorseless, it's repetitive. I just, I didn't really know what to make of this. I don't feel this gives me any sort of insight into Bernhard at all. Maybe I have to go and tackle one of his sort of bigger, more weightier terms. I gave it three stars, um, only because it was better than that. And finally, uh, Daniel Yuski, I said in one of my recent tag videos that, oh no, it wasn't a tag video, it was last week's Friday Reads, and, you know, who, everyone who's read House of Leeds, has anyone read other of Daniel Yuski's books? So I was very keen to do that. I read 100 pages of, a, of 360, and I will return to it, but I kind of feel I've got this book, and I'll, I'll explain why. So every page looks like this. I don't know how much in focus this is going to be. So there are two characters. There's Sam who is male and there is Hayley who is female and they are lovers. They are sort of slightly mythological art, mythological creatures. I mean, they're, not, they're not straight human but they have lots of human characteristics and they are sort of moving towards each other literally because every page, I don't know if you can see this, that is the page number uh, 92 uh, and it is also 329 uh, sorry two third <laughs> my eyes are not good enough uh, 269 because the two characters the two narratives are moving towards each other so time is moving uh, as, you know forward with Sam's narrative but we're going backwards from the future in terms of Haley's narrative so every page is a year, so in this case it's June, uh, sorry, January 30th, 1929. And you get historical facts in history from that year. So uh, Trotsky banished, Eamon de Valera's arrest and Ulster, Lindbergh's Morrow, Hoover's 15, 10,000 ton cruisers, Windy City and Valentine Massacre, Seven Go, etc, etc, etc. So in that respect it reminded me of David Marks, it reminded me of Annie Ono's The Years. Then you get very lyrical, poetic text for Sam there. Uh, and then and they're sort of going on a journey and sometimes he loses Hayley and sometimes he, you know, he, get, he meets her and stuff. And then you have to turn the book upside down. And so this is Hayley's side. So again, you get the historical facts from, uh, in this case, January, sorry, yeah, January, no, June 22nd, 1998. So... Um, Clinton versus New York, a quake, 144 go, which means 144 people died. Uh, Linda Tripp, Sampras's fifth, Florida fires. I would say in um, Sam's, there's always the winner of um, the Kentucky Derby and uh, also the World Series winner as a historical fact. And then you get Haley's text here. And that's it. There's, they are, it is a sort of a road journey. There is a sense of movement, but I didn't feel any sense of movement. And the only interest to me in continuing on with this book 
is to reach page 180, 181, when the two timelines will coincide and then flip. Because I'm interested to see how that works. Because Haley's here, you are reading it backwards. You're reading it like a sort of a Twitter stream. Um, but it doesn't have that feel. It doesn't feel like, you know, one of the ways, presumably, to read this book is every page you read the forward motion uh, in terms of years of Sam and then turn to the other side of the book for Haley's equivalent, because that way Haley's story will move forward, presumably, in a proper narrative time and unlike the way I'm reading it where she's moving one you know back in time and Sam is so I'm finding this a bit unsatisfactory really because nothing you know there is nothing you know I'm finding the historical facts more interesting in the same way as I did with Lucia by Alex Phoebe where the stuff about Lucia Joyce was less satisfactory because it was you couldn't get to grips with her which is kind of the point of the book because she'd been erased from history both as a woman but as the daughter of James Joyce and as an embarrassment to her because of her mental afflictions. But the interesting things in, in, in Lucia was the, the, the sort of little snippets of uh, e Egyptology and sort of finding a sarcophagus and a, and a mummy and all of that sort of stuff. So those bits are interesting for here, the actual history stuff, you know, which has been selected, which hasn't, which I, rem which I knew of, which I didn't. Um, but the actual body of the text, of the two characters, sort of their thought process is far less engaging. So there you have it. I'm desperate for a really good reading week because ever since uh, reading Women in June, which was a superb, on the whole, you know, produced uh, Valeria Luiselli's The Lost Children Archive, Jeanette Winterson's uh, Frankenstein, uh, and etc. etc. I've had a really bad sort of um, selection of books other than David Martin's uh, Reader's Block but I knew what I was getting with David Martin so it wasn't anything new so yeah I'm desperate for uh, something you know going to pick up the reading uh, I'm going to read Stefan Schweig's Confusion uh, next week and I'm also going to read Clarice Lispector's new book that uh, not new in the sense she's just written it but newly translated to English for the first time uh, called The Besieged City or something like that so hopefully between those two, that will pick up uh, the quality. So till next time, thanks very much.